Hello everyone and thank you for your interest in this community history webinar series. This series is designed to showcase community and local history projects from throughout Canada. In each webinar we will learn from project coordinators as they discuss their local history, the framework of the project, and highlight challenges they may have faced. My name is Jessica Knapp and I am the Online Engagement Coordinator for Canada's History Society and I will be your host. Canada's History Society is absolutely thrilled to be able to offer this webinar series as we are dedicated to promoting greater popular interest in Canadian history, principally through our publishing, education, and recognition programs. To learn more about Canada's History Society, I encourage you to go to www.canadashistory.ca and I've just popped it down in the uh, chat box so you can click on that later. Um, and if you are watching a recording of this webinar, uh, you will find the link in the description below. I would like to um, introduce today's speaker. Uh, today's webinar will feature Miranda Jimmy. Miranda Jimmy is a passionate Edmontonian and member of Thunder Child First Nation. She is a community connector and a fierce defender of truth. Miranda is committed to the spirit and intent of the treaty relationship and finds ways each day to demonstrate to others what this looks like. Miranda's professional life has focused on contributing to her community in a variety of ways. She has made a career in, a, in the not-for-profit and public sectors and currently is the Indigenous Arts Consultant for the Alberta Foundation for the Arts. In 2016, Miranda was, the Ave, was an Avenue Magazine Top 40 Under 40, being recognized for her work with RISE, Re Reconciliation in Solidarity Edmonton, an inclusive group promoting reconciliation in action and words. Since 2015, RISE has been able to engage more than 50,000 people in reconcili reconciliation efforts through social media, public events, interactive programming, and a self-published quarterly magazine. Wow. Uh, you can find Miranda sharing her thoughts on Twitter at TheMirandaJimmy and on her blog, MirandaJimmy.com. It is an absolutely, absolute pleasure to have Miranda be a part of this series, and I would like to welcome her to begin her presentation. Thank you so much, Jessica, and welcome to everyone who's joined us. Um, it's great to see some familiar names and some new names uh, learning about our project. Um, before I get started, I want to acknowledge the fact that uh, I'm coming to you live from Treaty 6, uh, the traditional territory of the Blackfoot, Cree, Dene, Nakota Sioux, and Soto peoples. Here on the banks of the North Saskatchewan, people have been gathering from across Turtle Island for time immemorial to trade, gather, learn, share, celebrate, and uh, teach each other. And I hope it's in that same spirit that we're gathered here today. Um, so I want to start to uh, also acknowledge uh, that this project, Reconciling Edmonton, um, was an uh, initiative of four people. I'm just representing the team. So um, Danielle Metcalf and I, who's also, I think, uh, joining us today with me in, um, Anna Marie Sewell and Jenny, that were all part of the project team that brought this together. Uh, I want to dedicate this presentation to uh, the memory of Colton Bushi and uh, the uh, many other Indigenous peoples whose lives were cut short and who didn't get the full opportunity to have an impact on this world. and. Um, it's in their memory and in recognition of those who are not with us that um, this project and, and the work that we're doing around reconciliation is so important. So Reconciling Edmonton, the idea uh, really came from the, the closing of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in 2015. Um, amongst the team, we wanted to provide people with an opportunity to think about reconciliation in the long term about the fact that this is this idea of reconciliation is really about relationship building between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people, and it's been happening for for centuries, for generations, from uh, the time of first contact and the agreement to treaties to present day, and we are constantly learning more about each other and how to how to live into that relationship. We also wanted to make sure that the exhibit and the idea was co-created with community. Um, yes, there were four people around the table that were involved in creating the project, but we wanted 
um, everyone to see themselves in this idea of reconciliation and find a way to actively participate. So um, in, in doing that, we wanted to involve the, the knowledge and the assets that exist in the community, knowing that poor people can't represent everyone. Um, even in the makeup of the team, we also wanted to think about um, who it was at the table. And so we had half Indigenous, half non-Indigenous um, co-leads of the project. We wanted settler and Indigenous voices working together. We also wanted to uh, make sure that there were examples of weaving in traditional knowledge and traditional teachings in this. And so the idea for, um, for people uh, was really important, as well as the idea of seven. So seven representing the seven generations from contact to present day, the seven sacred teachings that uh, were the foundation for the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and, um, and committing to that in ways to show examples that you can weave the learnings and teachings from traditional knowledge into the work that you do. Um, and that is an, an act of reconciliation in itself. So as I mentioned, the team uh, was four of us. So uh, myself, uh, who I, I'm Cree, uh, as mentioned in my bio, I'm a member of Thunder Child First Nation, which is on the Saskatchewan side of Treaty 6. I now make my home in Edmonton. And um, I'm an intergenerational survivor of residential school. My dad attended for 11 years. Through the work of the TRC and my commitment to reconciliation, um, I founded RISE, Reconciliation and Solidarity Edmonton. We're a completely volunteer-run group here in Edmonton. Um, talked about a little bit in my bio, but you can find us online. Um, second member of the team, Danielle Metcalf and I. Um, she's a writer, historian, um, and at the time was the historian laureate uh, for the city of Edmonton. Uh, yesterday, I saw on Twitter uh, there was a hashtag going around. We met on Twitter, and that's the story of me and Danielle. We met on Twitter. Um, next was Anna Marie Sewell, and she's uh, a well known Metis poet and writer and educator here in Edmonton. Uh, she was also the former poet laureate and um, is connected in, in the arts community here. And uh, last was um, Jenny Vett. Jenny is a visual artist, a, a painter. At the time, she was the artist in residence for the City of Edmonton Office of the City Clerk. And her space uh, where she painted and reflected back uh, through her visual art to the community, what she saw in City Hall, um, her, her studio was located right over the top of Council Chambers, which provided a bird's eye view into uh, decision making in our city. So that was our team. Uh, we came together um, with a bunch of ideas and ways of working and learned from each other and created friendships throughout uh, the whole project. So what was the process? Um, so I identified kind of seven steps that uh, was the process for the project. So first, we wanted to identify seven images, um, seven images that to us uh, represented the idea of reconciliation in different ways, from as far back as we could find photographic evidence to present day. Second was to paint the images large scale. So um, to take to take a archival photo and represent it in a different way, um, and allow people to see it in a different way. Third was to share both the photographs and the paintings on social media. Uh, this was a way to invite public interaction through the creation uh, process of the exhibit. This was on Twitter and um, Facebook, uh, in, in chat groups and listservs, uh, using the hashtag reconciling the egg. And um, through that, we collected responses and words. So what did people see? What did they identify? What were the questions that they had in the images? that uh, was important to them or uh, raised some questions or started conversations. And so we collected all those responses. If we use those responses and those words that we heard back from the community to weave together a piece of poetry to go with each image, um, thanks to the work of Anna Marie and Danielle, 
um, making sure that we were um, using that input and, and thoughts from the community in, in our own creative process. Uh, the sixth step was to bring together community partners, um, again, recognizing that there's assets beyond the four of us that um, could bring pieces of the puzzle together to make sure that the project and the exhibit reached as far as we could into the community. And last was to hold an, an event uh, to unveil the exhibit, um, a combination of the work that we had put in over several months, as well as um, the snippets of words and responses that people had heard or had seen on social media to see that reflected back to the community. Um, so those were the seven steps that uh, led to the project. So I'll just walk you through now the next uh, each of the seven steps. So first we had to find seven images. Uh, we visited uh, the City of Edmonton archives as a starting point. Um, it was a challenge to, to find positive images, to, to find images where Indigenous people and non-Indigenous people were represented um, in a positive way, that we had some sort of knowledge for, uh, for the photograph, whether it was the date, location, names of the people represented. That was a challenge um, to see how much information is missing from, from the record. It was also a challenge to narrow it down um, once we found all those images, we wanted to make sure that there was good representation across different decades, uh, across different ideas and reflections of what reconciliation is, and to make sure that um, there, were, there were different perspectives because reconciliation is not uh, a black and white, uh, straightforward conversation or reflection. It is about all of those. Um, different pieces that fit together um, and bring us together. So um, another challenge is that uh, at the City of Edmonton Archives, it was hard to find more recent photographs. So images that represented the relationship between Indigenous and settler people here in Edmonton after kind of the 1950s, it was, it was more challenging. So we had to cast the net a little wider. Um, we searched the catalog of the Provincial Archives of Alberta. Uh, we also reached out to several indi Indigenous community members who um, had their own personal archives or family archives where they might have photographs that would be important. And um, Anna Marie and I made a visit to the Aboriginal Multimedia Society of Alberta. They're um, a not-for-profit based in here in Edmonton that publishes Wind Speaker magazine and or newspaper and has been uh, reflecting Indigenous stories for a long time. So uh, when we were there, this, this photo uh, I, I snapped because Emily found a picture of herself in one of the one of the old uh, newspapers. So all of that brought us to um, several dozen images that were possibilities, and then we had to work together between the four of us to narrow it down and make sure that uh, each of our ideas of what we wanted reflected um, it within the seven and they span the decades that we wanted them to, as well as from um, Jenny's perspective that they were interesting enough images that would reflect well in, uh, in a painting. So that was our kind of decision making criteria and um, it, took, it took several weeks to get to that point. So once we had the seven images, then we had to um, uh, start sharing them. So I wanted to share with you just uh, the photograph. So this was the oldest uh, photograph that we uh, came across, and it was called Edmontonians of 1884. Um, what struck us about this particular one, and it was one of the easiest ones to choose, was the fact that um, there were three three men um, that uh, seem to seem to be who represented what Edmonton looked like in 1884. Also, in the archival record, it was um, only the Indigenous man was named, and the other two men were not named on the record. Um, so that's Chief Ermanson on the horse, and two settler guys. That, and all of them are fairly well-dressed, so we knew it must have been um, an important moment. 
but the fact that um, you know that he's sitting higher on the horse and and that uh, that it was important that his name was documented. Um, we thought this was really an interesting image. We also found out um, when we started to share these on social media that um, there are lots of history buffs up there that were um, glad to provide us with more information than we found in the archival record about what we wanted to do. More about that later. The second image was um, called Indian Dance uh, 1905. And uh, this image was striking for several reasons to us. Um, one, the first thing when I looked at this, it reminded me so much of the round dances that took place in the streets during I Don't Know More. And um, this fact of kind of owning and taking up space, uh, public space, for um, Indigenous gatherings, I thought was really interesting. Something else was um, interesting about this. In 1905, it was illegal for Indigenous men to be in the presence of uh, settler women. It was also illegal for Indigenous men to gather in numbers of 12 or more. It was illegal for ceremony or drumming uh, or dancing to take place in a public space. And all of this is happening in, the, in this image. Um, without for sure knowing, we believe that this is because of the um, the creation of the province of Alberta that this gathering was taking place. The third image uh, was called Indian Encampment, Kingsway Avenue. And so for those of you who know Edmonton, um, this is relatively the space where Kingsway Mall now stands. Um, it was in 1939 for the visit of uh, the king and queen. And um, you know, there's a uh, uh, you can see several several TPs, several people gathered in this space. Something thinking about this this image is that this boy might still be alive. Um, he'd be, you know, a senior now, an elder in the community. Um, but we were hoping that maybe we'd be able to connect with him or maybe one of his family members and hear his perspective. What does he remember about this image and this gathering? This uh, next image um, was called First Eskimo Baby Baptized in Edmonton at the Charles Tamsel Hospital in 1950. And when we shared these pictures, um, we didn't provide as much context. We didn't provide the name. We just said, what do you see in this picture? And um, this one in particular struck people in uh, a unique way because they they didn't see the direct correlation at the time between what does this have to do with reconciliation. Um, there were assumptions made that this was a kimono and this was a, a Japanese person uh, in the photo. So what does this have to do with indigenous reconciliation? The kimono ended up uh, influencing the uh, poem that was wrote for this one. This is Ralph Steinhauer. He was the Lieutenant Governor, uh, first Lieutenant Governor in Canada who was Indigenous um, in the 1970s. And this picture was taken in 1975 for um, his birthday. Uh, a full scale uh, birthday cake was made to represent the Alberta legislature. And so that's actually a cake behind him with, with giant. Uh, dining room table candles on top. Um, and uh, to know that Alberta and Edmonton at the time was leading the country in, in appointing an Indigenous man to this position, um, we thought was an important moment to share with people. This photo um, was taken at the first annual Alex Dakota Fun Run in 1983. And um, Again, if you take an image out of context um, and just share an image and ask people to respond to it, you can take some things out of this picture. Why are these two indigenous men you know, running? Why are there police cars behind them? Why is someone cheering on the side? And why does one person seem to be enjoying himself and the other one maybe not? 
Um, so that says a lot of things. Um, Alex Dakota was the first um, Indigenous police officer for Edmonton Police Service, and he also was a, a war veteran and was killed um, at Passchendaele. And so in Edmonton, the story of Alex Dakota is, is more recently started to be, to be shared. There's a, a new community named after him and a new public park in the downtown core. And so um, the Alex Dakota run still happens, but it's a, it's a small event and we hope to maybe raise awareness a little bit more about this. And the last image, the seventh image, was uh, a gathering that took place in uh, Churchill Square, which is in the downtown core of Edmonton. And it was on the one year anniversary of the Education Day, the first day of the national event, uh, the seventh and final national event of the TLC held here in Edmonton. There was a, a march from the conference center where the TRC took place to Churchill Square, and um, about 100 people gathered. Elder Francis Whiskey Jack uh, sang a song, and, and we danced hand in hand. Um, this is actually the first day Danielle and I met in person as well. Um, so to know that commemoration and honoring of this history is still happening, and that, that as a community we're finding ways to indigenize space and create space of community together. Um, this photo is from 2015. So those were the seven images that we chose for the project. So step two was to paint the images large scale. So um, Jenny worked, as I mentioned, in her studio, which was above Edmonton City Council Chambers, but she also uh, made sure that she painted in, a public, in public spaces around City Hall um, so that the public could interact as she painted. So um, she would sketch out the, the photo and um, paint it, and, and people would come up and ask what she was doing. And throughout the creation, she was sharing images like this, which was um, painting in process, again, using the hashtag, hoping that we would get responses and people asking questions. So step three was to share it on social media. Uh, this was, as I mentioned, with the hashtag. Uh, so once a week for seven weeks, each image was shared on Facebook and Twitter. Um, so similar to a post like this, um, what do you see in this photo? Um, and just collected responses. So prompting questions like, what do you see? What stands out for you? Who do you think these people are? What do you think are taking place? Um, and so. Many people responded um, over the seven weeks of sharing um, over a million impressions on social media, um, hundreds of responses, um, thousands of retweets, uh, which was really interesting to see how quickly it spread this idea. We really wanted to engage people in, and people responded. So through those responses, uh, we were able to collect uh, collect words, collect uh, questions, collect um, ideas. People saw different things in the photos than we saw, um, asked different questions than we asked. We also, um, as I mentioned, had people who um, loved to do this research, wanted to research and answer our questions. And um, this particular image, the first image, um, Edmontonians of 1884, even um, a year later, when Danielle and I were in Rideau Hall for the Governor General's Awards, we got more information about this photo. Um, the bits and pieces keep coming forward depending on who gets exposed to this. One of the interesting things we also did was took uh, copies of the photos to a grade six class um, at City Hall School. And for 45 minutes, they sat in groups and talked about each of the images. Um, distinctly, I remember a uh, a question about um, the second image, Indian Dance 1905, and this grade six class could not fathom why someone would improperly name the photograph Indian Dance, and they said, these are First Nations people, these are not Indian. Why would this get put in the archive uh, labeled wrong? It just did not make sense to them. And so that particular moment was so interesting to me to know that in a generation, 
the word Indian attached to that group of people um, was just so illogical. And um, to know that in a generation it's been wiped out, which I think is amazing and, and really speaks to the opportunity that education can play in the idea of reconciliation. So we ended up with um, 14 type pages of responses that had to be woven into uh, to the poetry. So then we had to write the poetry. So um, these uh, words, reactions were compiled. Um, uh, Anna Marie and Danielle used these words as inspiration. As I mentioned, um, the image with the kimono, um, just, just to pay homage to all the questions around that was um, the poem for that was a haiku instead of a instead of the format that the other the poems followed, um, and uh, it was amazing to see this process again from from a, a step back to watch how these words that have been collected over seven weeks were woven together and um, how pieces of them connected and told a, a community. Story or community response to each of these images. So the seventh, or, or sorry, the sixth step uh, was to bring our community partners together. So originally we had um, received a $2,500 uh, micro grant from the Edmonton Heritage Council to do this project. Um, that grew exponentially because of bringing partners to the table that offered in kind uh, support and um, and cash support and human resources and um, a variety of things that just um, continue to grow. And so um, the Edmonton Arts Council through the Artists in Residence program provided um, a lot of amplification of what we were doing through social media and making sure that, that people were invited to participate. The Canadian Native Friendship Center um, offered us support in the cultural component, making sure that we had um, elders and drummers involved um, in the event. The Edmonton Heritage Council, again, in addition to the micro grant, offered us support via social media, making sure that people got the word out. Uh, the City of Edmonton, both through the Artists in Residence program at the Office of the City Clerk, but also the Indigenous Relations Office. Um, provided us the space to, to work and to hold the event, um, uh, made sure that we had a printed program and a way to continue to share the exhibit afterwards and um, you know food and refreshments and microphones the night of and all of those things. And uh, through the work of RISE, we had um, uh, four or five dozen volunteers that uh, that came to celebrate with us with the unveiling, which was the seventh and final step. Um, so on uh, November 25th, 2015, uh, we ended up with over 500 people joining us at City Hall. Uh, we had the Grand Chief of Treaty 6, we had members of Edmonton City Council, uh, MLA elders and community members, and it was also the first time that um, I saw uh, a, an event around reconciliation that actually um, was a visible mix of people, Indigenous, non-Indigenous, newcomers, elected officials, um, Indigenous community members that had come from outside of the city of Edmonton. It was visible in the room um, and it was for me, a sign of hope that reconciliation is possible with four people committing to this and coming up with this idea and uh, making sure that there were ways for the community to be invited and to engage. We made the, um, the event at City Hall because um, it is this idea of this space in Edmonton that is a public space that is a place of decision making and power, but also should be a place of community and gathering, and everyone should feel welcome there. Everyone's ideas, perspectives uh, should be welcomed and included, and um, I think that night it definitely was. 
So what was the outcome? The outcome of the project was um, a community co-created exhibit that featured seven paintings and poems. Um, it also have it also has panels that talk about the process, the development process, and um, us as community or as co-creators and project leads, our perspectives on the project. It continues to create dialogue um, and opportunities to respond to the work. And um, when it's on display, we invite people to to respond and share, continually share what they what they feel in response to what they see. Um, also, the outcome that we planned fairly early on um, as part of the gathering and unveiling was the first ever round dance held in City Hall. And uh, it was a, a beautiful thing to be a part of and a beautiful thing to witness the transformation of this public space, indigenizing of this public space, and really an opportunity for people to physically engage in an act of reconciliation. So the exhibit continues to travel and be shown in and around Edmonton. We're actually in a process right now of applying for a grant that um, will help us um, fix up the exhibit a little bit and hopefully be able to travel it further um, outside of Edmonton uh, throughout the province and perhaps elsewhere for, for people who want to see it. Um, but it's, it's been me for half an hour talking about what it uh, what it is, but I'd like to show you. We're going to try uh, to show you a video of um, what happened that night when we, when we unveiled the, the exhibit. It's a pleasure to be here in the territory of Treaty 6. During this past year of reconciliation, we've embarked on a journey of rebuilding trust, reconciliation of Aboriginal and non-Indigenous cultures and people, bridging a long existing gap, something gaining momentum around the world. This event at City Hall reflected the reconciliation movement in Edmonton. It brings hope for, for all of us to work together for more healing, for more uh, uh, reconciliation, for, for more families to work together. <laughs> Our men and women are the ones who are shaping our communities. They're important. Our youth, as they as they're coming of age, we need to in, provide them more programs. We need to put them into areas that they can develop. And our children are coming up. They have to have that hope so that we can continue building our communities. We have to begin to heal. And the medicine for healing is the young people. Edmonton's Aboriginal population is younger than the rest of the population and is growing faster. Um, and I think there's a recognition that there's an opportunity for more Aboriginal people to engage in the economy and in the community. Um, and in order to do that, we need to build relationships with one another. There's a new beginning. Today we have more academic educated ever than ever in lifetime, while we're maintaining our customs, our traditions, and our songs and our languages. It's, an, it's a good time. The opportunities are are abundant. There's evidence of an Aboriginal presence here 10,000 years ago. But from destruction of culture in the mid-19th century, the effects of residential schools in Canada, the healing continues. The round dance is an ancient tradition. Well, a round dance is a, is a celebration, and um, it's a creation of unity and harmony. Um, everyone's equal in the circle and everyone plays a part that makes um, the dance continue and um, it's easy and accessible. Everyone can participate. Just as all can and must participate in reconciliation. The stronger we get as, as Native communities and we step in the, in the direction of independence uh, and the success of every community and every Indigenous person in this country, is going to be the success of all the people that they affect in their life as well. It's um, in the words that we use, the actions that we take in our daily lives, how we approach personal relationships. And so I hope that everyone will take that commitment to heart and um, move it forward. But we must uh, remain focused and, and practice and exercise the idea of reconciling all the time, every day. For God, I'm to dancing.
Uh, so that video will, um, it's on YouTube. I'll share a link uh, as part of the description if you want to watch it as well. Um, so just in closing, uh, I wanted to share this. This is the seventh uh, painting that Jenny that did the uh, round dance that took place in Churchill Square for the one year anniversary of the TRC event. In all the other paintings, the first six paintings, um, Jenny wanted to make sure she stood true to the image and didn't take too much uh, artistic uh, influence into what the image represented. But for the seventh image, she didn't want to paint it exactly how it showed up in, in the photograph. She wanted to just show the shadows of the people instead of the people at the front of the circle um, so that everyone could see themselves as part of the act of reconciliation. And, um, and I hope that that is really the ultimate impact that the project Reconciling Edmonton had, is that there was a, uh, an opportunity for people to see themselves acting into reconciliation, even if it was just in a small way. But it is those small ways, those small actions that will move us forward on this path of reconciliation. Um, so I, I'll end with that and happy to answer any questions or um, any comments that people have and uh, uh, looking forward to hearing from you. I would like to say thank you very, very much, Miranda, for this presentation. It is this uh, closer look at this process and the project. Um, that is so important for Canadians to be aware of, so much so that you actually included that as part of the gallery and the exhibit space. Um, as Miranda said, uh, we are opening the floor to questions. Uh, so if you have a question about the project that um, Miranda has shown here, uh, please ask if you have encountered this project prior to this, uh, this presentation. We'd love to hear about how you participated and um, what your thoughts and feelings were about it then. And to get things started, I am just going to ask Miranda about uh, that inclusion of the process in the in the outcome. And, and we're talking about it here today, too. So I would love to hear from you, Miranda, why it is so important for the public to know how we are doing things and, and how uh, yourself and, and the group that you worked with in the community um, comes together to to produce something like this. Well, I think um, this idea of reconciliation is really hard for people to understand and wrap their heads around. And um, ultimately, I think a lot of people are frozen in a place of fear of I don't know what needs to be done or there is so much that needs to be done, I have no idea where to start. And I hope that um, this project and the work that RISE is doing um, demonstrates to people that there is, it's these small acts of reconciliation. It, it can sometimes be as simple as a tweet or a Facebook message, um, sharing with your social network, raising awareness, asking questions, challenging our biases. All of those are acts of reconciliation and we have an opportunity every single day, dozens of times every day, to challenge ourselves to do and think differently. And that's ultimately what reconciliation should be about. Um, and I hope that it, it's those, um, those moments and people seeing it in other people to say, wait a second, there is a place for me in this process. And I do have the capacity and ability to make a difference. And that's what we wanted to do. Thank you. It's clear to me that um, yourself and the other women that were a part of this project were very uh, mindful of making sure that the community could participate at each step of the way. You've made it very, very accessible um, and uh, relevant. So through artwork and through poetry and visiting classrooms and social media, and uh, you definitely demonstrated um, what I, uh, you know, believe is very important in this space of public history, which is meeting people where they are. Uh, you made it 
uh, as easy as you could for people to participate. And, you know, you ask them to take a step and you did most of that work there. So that's, that's pretty incredible um, to be able to give, give so much uh, through a project like this. I would like to just take a look at what Fred has asked um, so we can take a second. Uh, yeah, thanks, Fred, for acknowledging that. Yeah, faith groups and um, uh, several churches were involved in residential schools and definitely have an active role to play in reconciliation. Many of the volunteers with RISE um, that are continue to be involved and as well as that were volunteering that night are uh, members of faith groups. Um, that image as well of the baptism at the Charles Camsel um, includes uh, a minister and we were able through sharing on social media um, to actually find out his name, which I'm blanking on at the moment. Um, but, uh, and I believe that he was also uh, an Anglican priest, if I remember correctly, and people recognized that. Oh, uh, there, Danielle just answered the question. Um, but because of his dress, and again, his name wasn't included in the photograph, um, but we were able to find that information out. And so, yes, there are ways for faith groups to participate. And um, ultimately, uh, you know, in preparing for this presentation, as well as thinking about the journey that's happened since the PRC here um, four years ago, um, I've seen a shift, actually, in, in faith groups who, um, uh, the first kind of step I see was them showing up, uh, which was really important, showing up, being present, listening, understanding. But I'm actually seeing, um, and they were, they were actively participating, and now I'm seeing this breakaway, um, which I'm not sure where it's going to go, uh, but here in Edmonton where, um, where faith groups are turning internal and having lots of conversations internal, but are closing that conversation to community. And I'm, I'm worried. I hope that uh, my worries are um, will subside. I hope that the internal conversations that, that's happening within church groups will um, is an important reflection and then will break open and will again invite community back in. But there is there has been that shift I've seen in the last couple of years. So, um, you you showing up today is a is a good uh, step in that in that direction, Fred. And I'd love to learn more about what you're doing around reconciliation and including Indigenous voices and perspectives and community members in that process. Thank you, Miranda. Thank you, Fred. Um, I did want to ask Miranda, what were some of the challenges that you faced through the development of this project and and um, continuing today as it, the gallery is still, uh, or the exhibition is still traveling. Um, lots, of, lots of challenges that were great learning opportunities for myself and I think for the other um, leads on this project. Um, the four of us have never worked together on something and so figuring out um, all of our ways of working, understanding one another, that was a, that was a big challenge. Um, and in a good way, um, uh, I work in different ways than the other two members do. And so learning how to communicate with each other and um, owning our work and owning the relationships within the process was, was really important. Um, finding ways to continually challenge ourselves to, to do things than we had, in different ways than we had previously done as well. Um, so, living into the acts of reconciliation in all the ways that we approach this project is really important. So, if we approach it in the way that we were, would have approached any other project, um, it would not have been an act of reconciliation. Um, we also had, uh, you know, as any project does, um, curveballs and challenges that came along the way. The one I thought of um, as that video was playing was. Um, uh, the night uh, we had, you know, close to 600 people show up, and um, you know, the the four of us were were on stage and involved in the um, the presentation, but also managing the logistics of the night. And um, we didn't have enough tobacco for the drummers that showed up, so an invitation was um, sent out to 
the drummers and a bunch of drummers showed up and we did not have enough tobacco to offer them. And so, uh, uh, you know, I was running around um, asking favors. And again, this is where the city of Edmonton's Indigenous Relations Office came in. Um, they made a quick exit stage left and came back with all the tobacco that we needed to offer the drummers. Um, we would not have had a round dance without that um, participation and uh, inclusion. So um, those things happen, but hopefully it's because of the relationships we've built along the way that when hiccups happen, you have easy, quick solutions because of the network that we have. Um, going forward, so since then and going forward, um, the challenge really has been around um, keeping this project alive and so finding places to exhibit it that um, the artwork will be taken care of in a good way and um, and it, it takes up a lot of physical space and uh, this is a challenge that I think we hadn't anticipated is that going forward we want it to be in public spaces, we want it to be accessible to the community but that amount of physical wall space is hard to find in public buildings um, in a place where it will be safe and secure and taken care of. So um, finding locations has been a challenge and continues to be a challenge, but we're, we're finding places for it to be. Thank you for sharing that with us. I know it's not always easy to share what you, um, project coordinators struggled with and the challenges that they faced throughout. throughout. Um, so thank you very much for being open and sharing that with us today. You um, referred to it a little bit in your, in my next question in your recent response, which is uh, you were able to, you know, overcome some of those challenges because of the support that you had and because of the networks um, that were there and present. And I wanted to ask, how did you go about getting the support for this project? Um, well, as I mentioned initially, it was a, it was a grant application that Danielle took the lead on, getting us twenty five hundred dollars. Um, and twenty five hundred dollars does not go very far. Um, it covered, um, you know, a little bit of our time and research, um, some of the supplies, but really we would not have been able to host an event for nearly 600 people on $2,500 total. Um, so because the four of us had never worked together and we all came from different parts of the community, we all came with our own networks and connections. And so that was really the key, um, bringing those networks together, sharing the story of what it was that we were trying to achieve with people. And it just um, more and more kind of people came forward or ideas came forward of how they could help. And um, I don't think the, the partnership piece was not really the challenge um, for us in the fact that um, I think we all spoke really well to what the intent of the work was and people were inspired by that and wanted to get involved. Um, even, at, even at the city of Edmonton, it would have been, been seen as an obvious choice to work with the Indigenous Relations Office, but the Office of the City Clerk that manages meetings and um, takes minutes and agendas for city council um, wouldn't have seemed like an obvious partner, but this was a, a way to also uh, bring in different departments within the city of Edmonton to say every every role within the city administration has a part to play in reconciliation, and this was a small way that they could support the event as well. Um, Danielle's also talking about um, the, the social media. So um, having people involved through the seven weeks of sharing the images, people were getting excited of, about the unveiling and also wondering if their little piece of um, what they shared would, would ultimately make it into um, the part of the end product. And it, it was interesting to see it spread. And so um, who picked it up, who shared, who retweeted, who posted to Facebook. Um, that created also this, this broad network of people who felt ownership and responsibility and connection to the work, which um, hopefully has led to a longer term connection to the idea of reconciliation as well. 
Thank you so much for sharing. That's um, it's very enlightening to know um, what you're kind of looking for before you start a project like this. Uh, what you're looking for people to looking for in people to to be collaborators and and be part of the support system and being strategic, but also letting them come um, naturally because they are interested and they believe in this work. Um, so I'd like to wrap up today's webinar by asking you a final question, which is what kind of advice would you give to people in other communities in Canada that are hoping to either be a part of something similar or to spearhead something similar to this? I think if you're doing any work around this idea of reconciliation, that needs to be the heart of your intent. And so you need to constantly challenge yourself to find ways to work into the spirit of reconciliation in everything that you do, every conversation you have, every plan that you make, every dollar that's raised, whatever it is in the project plan, find ways to make sure that reconciliation is at the core of that. Um, ultimately, in the idea of reconciliation and also in this project, we don't want people to make snap decisions and think they have it all figured out and um, go on their merry way. We want to make sure that you're constantly challenging and thinking about new ways of understanding, doing, and um, finding ways to make sure that Indigenous voices are included in the conversation, are included in the process, and um, values of reconciliation and the treaty relationship are fundamental to the process. And so whatever the outcome is that you intend to do, if it's around this topic of reconciliation, um, making sure that that is the basis for all decision making. Beautiful. Thank you so much. And we've gotten word from Danielle, and she agrees too. So that's that's a wonderful note for us to end on. Um, I would like to again express my gratitude to you, Miranda, for joining us, taking the time from your day, joining us for today's presentation, as well as everybody that is in this uh, online meeting room with us today. Thank you for being here. Thank you for listening. Um, it means a lot that people are interested in learning about how community projects are coming together and the histories that they are sharing. Uh, it's so important for us to learn about what is going on in communities around Canada um, because people are coming to this and doing things in different ways and there's always something to be learned uh, in those spaces. So thank you. Thank you again. I just want to say thank you again to everyone who joined us and who will watch in the future online. And um, just acknowledge my, uh, my co-leads on this project, Danielle, Anna Marie, and Jenny. Um, it's because of the four of us and the strength that we all brought that we made this possible. And I think it's because of each our of our own and our community's commitment to reconciliation that this continues to be an important topic. So thank you all.